have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a man telephoning an employment agency to register for job opportunities. First, you have some time to look at questions one to ten. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation, and answer questions one to ten. Able Employment, how may I help you? I saw your advertisement in the Daily Gazette. Oh yes. And I'd like to register with you. I'm a student, but I've got the long holiday coming up. Certainly, I'll just get the form ready. Okay, let me take your details. Sure. Can I have your full name? It's Bowen, James Bowen, B O W E N. Right, and your address, please. Well, just now I'm staying at the youth hostel. I see. But I'm moving into a flat on Friday. Well, give me that one then. It's four Lion, like the animal, Road, Melford, M F four. Five J B. Okay, and then I need to have a phone number for you. Uh, I don't know the number at the flat yet, but I could give you my mobile. That's o double nine five four seven two one eight double two. Would that do? For the time being, but if you can let me know your new number when you can. Of course. Now qualifications. What qualifications have you got? I mean. Post sixteen qualifications. Well, I stayed on at school till eighteen and got my A levels. Fine. Anything else? You said you were a student. Yes, and then I've done two years at college, so I've got my history diploma. Though I don't know how useful that'll be for getting a job. Well, it depends. Everything counts in some way. And I also did an IT course this year, and that got me my computer skills certificate. Which I certainly hope is relevant. It's different anyway. Um, that's all really.、Mm, that's quite a good range. And what about on the practical side? What work experience have you got? Well, not too much because I've mainly been studying. Yes. But two summers ago, I worked just as general assistant in a hospital for about three months. It was quite hard, but very interesting. Okay. Anything else? If you include part-time work, oh yes, I've often worked in the college holidays as a tour guide, showing visitors round. That's quite enjoyable, meeting people. I'm sure. Hmm. Now on to interests. There's space here for two. What would you say? Two. Uh. Well, I like various sports, but I suppose we should put that I'm in the swimming club. I'm pretty committed to that. Yes, that sounds good. And for the other one, something different. I'm very keen on music too, and I love playing piano. I've been doing that for over ten years now. Yes, I'll put that down. Well, that's more or less it for the time being. Uh、mm、huh. -hmm. Just one more thing. What I do need is your availability. Oh yes. Um, the college term finishes on June the twentieth. And then I'm going to visit my parents, but I can be back and ready to start on June the twenty eighth, if that seems okay. I'm sure it is. Now, what happens next is that I process this information, and then. 
That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a guide named Matt, who is introducing their trip in Wildlife Haven. Now you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen to the first part of the introduction carefully, and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Matt, and I'm one of the three guides here at Wildlife Haven. Our job is to make sure that you all have a great time here with us and go home feeling happy and relaxed. As you can see, we're away from the city in a remote area between a national park and the sea. To encourage you to relax. There are no radios or TVs, and the only phones and newspapers are in the office. So, if peace and quiet is what you've come for, this is the place to be. From your cabin on the hill, you'll find you have the national park behind you, and you can look out from the sea from your front balcony. Your luggage will be unloaded from the bus and taken to your rooms in a few minutes. Once you have picked up your key at reception, please locate your room and check that all your luggage has arrived. The daily program here at Wildlife Haven is flexible, and only as demanding as you want it to be. You should each have a brochure setting out the facilities and various walking tracks you can take. And on the bus, you are given a green sheet setting out a number of group tours in the coming week. If you want to join any tour, just write your name and room number on the relevant sheet along the wall here. Tomorrow, there is a beachcombers and rockhoppers tour. Exploring marine life in the rock pools along the beach, or if you'd prefer to go inland, there's a guided forest walk that takes you off the walking tracks. If you want to catch some lunch, you could join the beach fishing expedition. And at night, you'll see there is a moonlight forest walk that leaves each night at 7 p.m. So there is plenty to choose from at Wildlife Haven, and of course, that includes just sitting on your balcony watching the waves roll in. But I would recommend my favorite tour, the waterfall walk. This departs at sundown each day, and also provides the opportunity to have a moonlight swim. Now you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. In the second part of the introduction, you are going to get some advice from Matt. Listen carefully and answer questions sixteen to twenty. You've chosen to visit us in January, which is one of our hotter months. And although you may be tempted to wear a minimum of clothing, you should always take precautions against injury, particularly in the national park. This includes sensible footwear. You'd be surprised how many of our guests ignore this advice and end up being sorry. And socks are a good idea too. And even though you might be under trees a lot of the time, it's a good idea to wear a hat in this hot climate. There's no need to be too concerned about walking in the national park, provided you use common sense. It's true that there are poisonous spiders in the park, but they are really more frightened of you than you are likely to be of them. I should also warn you against eating any wild berries. Some are edible, but you should avoid them all. We'll provide all the food you can eat. Well, that's about all for now. Dinner is from six to eight p.m. in this building. This is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between two students, David and Jane, and their tutor, Dr Wilson, about their group research project into local history. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, David, Jane. Hello. Hi. So, how's the local history project going? Are you making good progress? Yes and no. Oh? Well, we anticipated problems of various kinds. None of the group has much experience of collaborating on projects. But we spent some time discussing how to go about it and thrashed out what seemed a useful approach. But it seems that Jane and I are the only ones actually following the plan. That's meant that the whole project has been lacking coordination, and so we've fallen behind our schedule. I see. That's tricky. Yes, it is. We felt that the targets had been defined, so we'd all know what to deal with. But looking back, we probably should have really specified individual responsibilities. As it is, we only have a loose sense of what should be done by who. Well, this is quite a common problem, actually. I take it that you've had enough group meetings, so you're looking for an effective solution. If you go to the resource centre, I think you'd find the advice service they provide there helpful at this point. Thanks. We'll go there later. On a specific note... I think we've got carried away with recruiting people to interview at the expense of building up the reference section, which I don't think is going to be solid enough. Do you think that'll be a major problem? Hmm. I'd have to see how much is there to be sure. But, well, you'll have to be pragmatic at this point, I think. What you'd better do is ensure your methodology is really strong, so at least you can't be faulted on that front. Then, if people challenge your results... At least you've carefully reported how you reach them. Do you see what I mean? Yes. yes. So? Yes, I think one resource in relation to that that we haven't exploited as fully as we might is the Internet. I've taken a lot of journals off the library shelves to go through, but actually there are websites where you can call up lists of approaches or data sets really quickly. I think that's a good idea, yes. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, let's think about the field trip and at least make sure that goes as well as possible. You're going to Cambridge on the 22nd. The Monday, yes. It's quite soon now. And in the morning, you'll be travelling and then getting settled into the hotel. Uh-huh. But you need to get down to work after lunch, of course. Now, I've arranged for you to have a look at some useful visual material, especially photographs and old magazines and newspapers which is included in an exhibition at the library in the university. That sounds like a good starting point. There's quite a lot on show, so that'll occupy most of the afternoon. Then the following morning, I want you to go and talk to someone in the city library. His name's Jarvis Gregson. He works in the education section there, and he's an expert on the area's history. Don't, of course, forget to take a tape recorder with you so that you can record what he tells you. Mm -hmm. And to have our questions ready. Indeed. OK, and the afternoon's free for you to wander around, get the feel of the place. Do some sightseeing. As you wish. It's a beautiful city. Mm. But it's back to work on Wednesday morning. 
Concentrate on the central area and walk around methodically. You'll have the plans I'm getting ready for you from different periods, and your task is to compare those with the makeup of the city today. Make notes on how different kinds of shops and businesses have grown up, what's gone, and so on. I hope the weather's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes,、uh, and in the afternoon, I want you to think about producing your own records. Along the lines of the ones in the city library's archives, the history of the castle is very important to the city's development. So use a camera to get some pictures that reflect that, if you can, showing it in relation to the buildings and spaces around it. We'll try. And when do we travel back? That's up to you. You can either decide to. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about fireworks. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this short talk on the subject of fireworks. Now, fireworks, as I'm sure many of you know, were invented in China, though there has long been disagreement as to exactly when, or even in which century. The consensus nowadays, though, is that it was in the sixth, as there is considerable evidence. Of war rockets being made, then we also know that fireworks were in use by the seventh century in Arabia, where they were called Chinese arrows, reflecting their military potential. It then took a long time for them to spread to Europe. In fact, it wasn't until the twelve hundreds that fireworks made their appearance there. The basic ingredients of fireworks have changed little to this day. Their explosive capacity comes mainly from black powder, also known as gunpowder, which is produced from a mixture of charcoal, sulphur, and potassium nitrate. A modern aerial firework, the kind used nowadays in big public displays, not the small rocket type that you might remember from your childhood, is normally made in the form of a shell. Often a sphere about the size of a peach. Inside the shell are a number of stars surrounded by black powder, and running through the centre of the round shell is a charge that makes the firework explode when it reaches the desired altitude. This is known as the bursting charge. When this explodes, it ignites the outside of the stars, which begin to burn with bright showers of sparks. Since the explosion throws the stars in all directions, you get the huge sphere of sparkling light that is so familiar at firework displays. A shell of this kind is launched from a 75 millimeter diameter mortar, which in some ways resembles the type used by the military. The mortar is a steel, or increasingly for safety reasons, shatterproof plastic pipe. This is likely to be 500 millimeters long, and sealed at one end. The other end is aimed at the sky, and at the bottom of the pipe, below the shell, is placed a cylinder containing black powder. This has a long fuse, 
which projects out of the tube. When this is lit, it quickly burns down to the lifting charge, which explodes to launch the shell. In so doing, it also lights the shell's fuse. The shell's fuse burns while the shell rises to its correct altitude and then ignites the bursting charge so it explodes. More complicated shells are divided into sections and burst in two or three phases. Shells like this are called multi-break shells. They may contain stars of different colours and compositions to create softer or brighter light, more or less sparks, etc. Some shells contain explosives designed to crackle in the sky, or whistles that explode outward with the stars. The sections of a multi-break shell are ignited by different fuses, and the bursting of one section ignites the next. The shells must be assembled in such a way that each section explodes in sequence to produce a distinct, separate effect. The pattern that an aerial shell paints in the sky depends on the arrangement of stars inside the shell. For example, if the stars are equally spaced in a circle, with black powder inside the circle, you will see an aerial display of smaller star explosions equally spaced in a circle. To create a specific figure in the sky, for instance a heart shape, you create an outline of the figure in stars inside the shell. Then you place explosive charges inside those stars to blow them outward into the shape of a large heart. Each charge has to be ignited at exactly the right time, or the whole thing is spoiled. Many other shapes have particular names, like the willow. This is formed by stars that fall in the shape of willow tree branches, spreading a little to the side and then downwards. The high charcoal composition of the stars makes them long-burning, so they may even stay visible until they hit the ground. The ring shell is fairly basic. It is produced by stars exploding outwards to produce a symmetrical ring of coloured lights. More complex is the pattern created by the palm, which contains large comets, or charges, in the shape of a solid cylinder. These travel outwards, explode and then curve downwards, like the limbs of a palm tree. The serpentine, the last one for now, is different again. When this one bursts, it sends small tubes of incendiaries scattering outwards in random paths, which may culminate in exploding stars. It can be quite spectacular. That is the end of...